Why does no one rank Warner Brothers animation? They have Batman, Scooby-Doo, Tom and Jerry. Plus, they've created some of my favorite animated movies ever. So let's give them the credit they deserve. Scoob, young Shaggy befriends puppy Scooby-Doo and even gives him his name. They are bullied during Halloween. Velma Dinkley, Fred Jones and Daphne Blake come to their rescue and solve a case in the process. They start solving cases together. Scooby becomes a target for an ancient quest. Scooby and Shaggy meet their superhero Blue Falcon while fighting off supervillain Dick Dastardly. This movie falls flat after the first 15 minutes. It starts off super cute and actually resembles Scooby-Doo, but then it just goes off the rail. Why they couldn't have kept this as an origin story of how the gang met and started solving mysteries is beyond me. Instead, the story spirals off in a million directions and is filled with tons of poorly executed pop culture references. The plot is just nonsense and boring. I don't love the animation style. They look like they are made from plastic, and the voice acting is kinda off-putting because, for the most part, none of the characters sound like any incarnation of them from the past which is strange as some of the old cast members spoke about wanting to return and were disappointed not to be asked. It just didn't seem like Scooby-Doo. The major weak point about the movie was the mystery part, as when it comes to Scooby-Doo, there has to be a ghost, ending with that iconic removal of the face mask following those meddling kids. Sadly, you won't see that this time, and that's sad. Very, very sad. I hope the next movie doesn't get me so upset. Space Jam A New Legacy For a very basic overview, Space Jam A New Legacy sees Warner Brothers' sentient artificial intelligence Al hatch a plan inside the server-verse to finally get the recognition he feels he deserves. Central to that mission? Abducting LeBron James and family to play in a high-stakes basketball game that pits father against son. Along the way, James must root out the old loony gang for the epic court contest. I will readily admit that nostalgia for the original got me into the theater to see this sequel. Absolutely no doubt about that. However, I will not concede that the same nostalgia is preventing me from giving this one a good rating. The first Space Jam was corny and goofy, but it had its own unique charm and a simple yet acceptable plot that made the involvement of Jordan and other NBA players make sense as much as a cartoon basketball game movie could. This, however, is straight up bad. The plot is so generic and boring that I cannot tell if the writers were trying to make it a cliché or if they were just that bad. The acting is awful, and that's putting it nicely. The acting and lines were just bad. Actually, it was horrible. No joke, even the Looney Tunes acting was bad. How do you screw that up? It wasn't even funny. I seriously don't think I laughed once. There's so many product placements and pseudo commercials all over the place. It takes people out of the story and makes it feel like you are just watching endless commercials for 120 minutes. The film lacks the heart and charisma that made the original Space Jam a cult classic. Only recommended for kids or those who are easily suckered into crossovers. I promise that the next movie will get better. Quest for Camelot. Evil Knight steals the sword Excalibur and plunges Camelot into chaos. The only hope is Kaylee the plucky, super cute farm girl, tomboy, teenage daughter of a round table knight Ruber killed years ago, who manages to rope a blind forester stable boy named Garrett and a two-headed dragon mutant into helping her retrieve Excalibur. Comedy, chaos and mayhem ensues. I watched this when I was little and found it mildly amusing. When I watched it again as I got older, I saw that there was simply no good plot or interesting characters in it. I think the movie has too many songs in it. The quality of those songs is uneven. Some are good, some are very forgettable. One of the songs was nominated for an Oscar. It's a shame that the characters' voices don't fit with the singing voices. The music just starts instead of having a proper transition. The character designs are not so attractive, and the quality of the animation is really not good, even when taken into account the year of production. The characters are not well written or developed, and the plot is overwhelmingly simple and uninteresting. The love story between Kaylee and Garrett happens too fast and isn't convincing. I know it's just a kid's movie, but there's still no excuse for some of the things I brought up. It seems that Warner Bros. just wanted to create a Disney-like movie but missed a lot of the key things that make Disney movies great. Tom and Jerry the movie. After bluffing her way into a job at a prestigious New York City hotel, a young woman named Kayla learns that there's one tiny problem. 
a mouse named Jerry has recently moved in and is causing havoc with a high-profile wedding that's scheduled in only a few days' time. And so, Kayla hatches a plan and hires a cat named Tom to take care of the problem. And as expected, chaos ensues. Alright, this movie is not really bad, but not really good. As someone who loved the original cartoon, this was so disappointing. Why did they think that we wanted to watch an hour of wedding drama and boring human subplots? This would have been so much better if they just cut out all the human stuff and stuck to what made the originals so great. The story is lame, and the cast is horrible. I wanted a movie about Tom and Jerry, their own background and origin, not something about a lame hotel and a weird over-the-top wedding being planned. Then you can put Tom and Jerry in any film. It should have been about them. The plot is bad, and basically Tom and Jerry do not look good as cartoons in a live-action movie. Hopefully, we will have something better in the future. Osmosis Jones. I had never heard of Osmosis Jones before, but I grew up watching the animated series based on this movie, so I went into it with excitement and a nostalgic drive. What I got was rather mixed. Let me explain. The live-action parts pretty much sucked, in my opinion. This guy named Frank is a single father taking care of his daughter and is a really unlikable father figure. I never felt sorry for him one minute. Mix that with gross-out humor, which wasn't even helped the slightest by Bill Murray, who is usually really funny. Enough said about that because the animated segments were actually pretty awesome. The world inside Frank's body was impressive in how it was crafted. How it functions by having a whole community run by a mayor and a police force of white blood cells. And a lot of real-life city stuff showcased a lot of creative effort was put into it. It centers on a white blood cell. Osmosis Joan, who is that kind of cop who does things his own way, and the others at the police station do not approve of his ways, but he is later assigned to a new case with a partner to keep him on track, a coal pill named Drix. Sure, it follows all the buddy cop movie cliches with nothing new added, but the world they must explore and the colorful characters they meet make it entertaining, albeit predictable. I found Osmosis Jones enjoyable, but flawed. I understand why it failed in theaters, but I have seen so much worse elsewhere. The Lego Movie 2. Little Boy, who is the author of the Lego Universe, has his kid sister come down into the same space of the house with her Duplos, and repeatedly, she just trashes everything cool that the little boy does. She steals some of the Legos and makes them do girly things. From the perspective of the Legos, they are just randomly being attacked. When I watched the first Lego Movie, I absolutely fell in love with it. I admired the message, and most of all, the unique sense of humor. It was creative, unique, and surprisingly heartfelt. Unfortunately, none of these words could be used to describe the Lego Movie 2. This sequel tries so hard to be awesome, maybe a little too hard. The humor feels forced, and the plot doesn't make a lot of sense. They also try to shoehorn in a message at the end that seems unnecessary. The animation is great although it doesn't feel quite as unique as when the first movie came out. I felt the new characters were flat, and they spent too much of the film in the real world compared to the first film, leaving it feeling choppy. I don't want to sound too harsh here. I hope they learn something from this misstep. DC League of Super Pet Superman and Crypto the Superdog have been best friends since birth. When the entire Justice League is kidnapped, Crypto must create a crime-fighting league of his own, so he enlists the help of Shelter Pets to save the Justice League and all of Metropolis. Well, this wasn't actually terrible. It's not great, but mildly entertaining. However, I can't help but feel like this had the quality of a streaming film. I expect a little better from The Rock and Kevin Hart. It started out pretty rough, but honestly, after a bit it had some pretty fun moments. Sure, I could tell you what the whole story would be after 10 minutes, and it was a little dumb at times, but it's fun. The animation is extremely flat and generic, but it's still colorful and energetic enough to just about make up for it. The soundtrack is really good with song choices that add to the heartwarming nature. My grumble is that this film is slightly too long. Personally, I think this film should have been cut down to 90 minutes, partly because of the target audience's attention span and partly because it does get bogged down in a couple of places with unnecessary details that add nothing to it. Space Jam, an evil animated monster, runs Moron Mountain, a planet with an amusement park. They need a new ride, so he sends five helpers to Earth to kidnap the Looney Tunes characters. Then they can be used as a new act at the amusement park. Bugs and the others agree. If they play them in a basketball game and win, 
Bugs and the others convince Michael Jordan to help them, but the aliens have evil plans up their sleeve. This movie is filled with nostalgia all the way back to 1996, back when having live action in an animated environment was mind-blowing. This movie is certainly nothing fantastic. The story is far-fetched, even for Looney Tunes standards, and it does not deliver any memorable lines like we've seen in many of their well-known cartoons. However, I have seen this many times and still love it to this day. It was a big movie from my childhood and is certainly great nostalgia. The movie does hold up pretty well as a great family film. Obviously, people of all ages love the Looney Tunes. I find it impossible to not feel joy when Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck is on screen and watching them play basketball with the surprisingly good actor and professional basketball player Michael Jordan, who has a great presence on screen against a group of aliens is fun and enjoyable from start to finish. Comedic actors such as Bill Murray and Wayne Knight are more fun for adults and provide some great one-liners. I really liked this movie as a kid, and I still love it to this day. The Lego Ninjago Movie It's based on the Lego Ninjago toy line, and it tells the story of six teenagers living in the land of Ninjago that must defend their home from an evil warlord. The film looks fantastic, the animation in the action scenes can contain a little too much judder, but other than that, I have no complaints about the look of this movie. The characters are fun enough. The villain has some good moments with humor that was to my taste. The music is breezy yet atmospheric. The voice actors do a good job with what they're given. Justin Theroux in particular is excellent. The father-son relationship does have some heart. It's not particularly new, to put it lightly, but it is the film's one attempt at depth and it's done pretty well. One of its main problems is that it now feels a little repetitive and stale after the previous two movies. Following Lego Batman with Lego Ninjago was always going to have an anticlimactic feel to it. Looney Tunes, back in action. The plot concerns DJ Drake and Daffy Duck venturing on a mission to rescue the former's father who has been kidnapped by the sinister ACME Corporation. They are trying to get their hands on a mysterious diamond that has supernatural powers. It's good, very entertaining, and worth watching. The humor is excellent with some very funny moments and very clever spots. It helps a lot to know your Looney Tunes characters, and it helps a great deal to know your film history. References to old films and characters are everywhere. For that reason, I would recommend this film for classic movie fans. They'll be pleasantly surprised. On the downside, I found the film too loud which is no surprise since cartoons tend to be that way. The loudest may have been Daffy Duck, who is a major player in this film. The female lead, Jenna Elfman, appears too hard-looking and just not likable to me. The positives outweigh the negatives, however. If you can put up with the loudness and the occasionally silly acting, Steve Martin is brutal here in that regard, you'll still get a ton of laughs out of this movie. Storks. Storks tells the story of Junior, who is a stork. Storks used to deliver babies, but they stopped. Now they deliver packages to various people around the world. However, an unfortunate mishap causes a baby to appear in the stork headquarters. Now, it is up to Junior, with the help of the human girl Tulip, Katie Crown, to deliver the baby before any other stork finds out. Storks will never be up there with the greatest animated films, which have more focused plots, humor of more consistent quality balanced with great emotional power, and for some, a dark and daring element. However, Storks is also a long way from being one of the worst. There are many reasons to like Storks. The visuals are spectacularly beautiful. The colors are incredibly rich. The backgrounds are rich in imagination and detail. And the characters are all modeled well. The soundtrack is infectious and upbeat, but also dynamic, with some tender, understated pathos at the end. The dialogue is on the silly side, but there are some amusingly witty moments. I loved Tulip, and the wolves were hilarious. The biggest problem with Storks is the story. It definitely has its moments, but things do get overcomplicated and chaotic. Predictability is high in the second act, and the pacing is erratic. This movie was a fun ride and took me by surprise. I'm not sure if every kid will enjoy this movie, but I think adults who like awkward humor and great animation will enjoy it.
Smallfoot. At first glance, I really thought it was just an average animated movie with added adventure to the mix. But looking beneath the surface, you will enjoy every minute of it and be surprised at how genuine the message they are trying to convey is. Along the way, we get a cast of very memorable characters, from the protagonist to the father, to the conspiracy theorist to the human. The quest they go on has lots of action and emotional resonance. The songs were pretty average though, except for the backstory rap song, which was a breath of fresh air. However, from a personal opinion, Smallfoot wasn't without drawbacks. In terms of content, it is never dull, but with a lot on display, it could have slowed down a little and tried not to do as much. Parts did feel overstuffed. Some of the humor didn't work, Parts are too random and tended to be inappropriately placed. All in all, an excellent quest with good values that does not devolve into dramatic oversimplification or edginess. Cat Don't Dance The plot is fast-paced but easy to follow, with very likable characters and many funny situations and clever dialogues, not to mention the incredibly catchy songs that were the best part of the movie. The biggest issue I had with this movie was that the plot didn't seem to travel or cover any real distance of time. It seemed over too quickly. The ending was actually the most generic aspect of this movie. The ending song wasn't very spectacular, and it held the movie back a little bit. The romance was also a little forced. It is a very well-animated movie that is both incredibly funny and entertaining. Its biggest drawback is that it has some forced cliches thrown in here and there that don't seem as creative as the rest of the movie. All of the characters were likable. I was surprised that such a good movie could not be remembered by the general public. Teen Titan Go Movie I do not really like the Teen Titan Go show. I will admit to feeling a bit nervous though before watching Teen Titans Go to the movie. There are better examples of animation out there, but Teen Titans Go to the movies is a huge improvement over Teen Titans Go, with many of that show's flaws being corrected. By all means, a few of the faults remain. Not all the jokes land. Much of the writing has actually improved significantly, but some of the jokes are juvenile and misplaced. Problems with pacing remain at times too. There are parts that are too hyperactive and rushed, and a few parts drag. However, the animation is a big improvement. It is more vibrant, more detailed, much smoother with more expression and nuance. Imagination is also here too. The music, which actually was the only good thing about the show, is insanely catchy and atmospheric, except it's placed even better and it's more inspired. The story is thin, admittedly, and can be rushed, but there are some nice surprises, a surprising intelligence, a bright and breezy nature, and much more of a balance of comedy and drama the former not going overboard, and the latter not neglected. On top of that, there is an appealing charm and light-heartedness. All of this cannot be said for the show. Characters are far more interesting and likable. Robin has depth to him, and while the other Teen Titans could have had more screen time, a good job is done with Raven and Beast Boy too. There's also a nice mid-credits tease that sets up the next movie, the Lego Batman movie. Lego Batman movie is an amazing film. The animation is unique and flawless. It is fantastic how the animators over at Warner Animation Group bring these Lego figurines and building blocks to life. The highlight of the movie is how it references and pokes fun at all the previous big screen incarnations of Batman. The 3D immerses you into the proceedings on screen. This film is hilarious, with the one-liners being delivered by all the characters non-stop. It also does justice to the sentimental aspects of Batman's story. The story is sweet and touching without being overly emotional, finding that perfect balance of comedy and drama, and manages to fit in so many quotable jokes and memorable moments. I never thought hearing what Batman's password is would make me laugh out loud, nor did I think I needed to see Robin alongside Batman in a feature film again, but they made it work. That has to be what's most impressive. They made things work that shouldn't work in a Batman film to extraordinary levels. The Lego Batman movie is a must watch for die hard Batman fans and newcomers alike. The Lego movie. I'd be surprised if anyone saw this coming. The Lego movie is quite simply unlike anything seen in a long while. Rip roaringly hilarious, gorgeous to look at, imaginative beyond belief, a great parody of worn-out, chosen one cliches, and also rather poignant and touching. The first thing one has to mention is the animation. 
The amount of detail and creativity put into the visuals is just staggering. At times, there's so much going on the screen, it's almost overwhelming. Yet if you look closely, you can see that every single thing is comprised of recognizable Lego parts. The various ways the world shifts, breaks, is constructed again, falls apart and moves around are simply a joy to watch. The script is a roller coaster ride of hilarious gag after another. The jokes come at you so fast you can't catch them all in one viewing, and blink and you'll miss it side gags clutter the screen. No running gag wears out its welcome. No joke is overplayed or overemphasized. The characters are all funny and likable, with enough personality to fill up multiple movies on their own. And due to LEGO having rights for nearly every IP imaginable, you won't be able to guess which mega franchise is going to turn up next. The LEGO movie is a downright masterpiece. There's no two ways about it. Incredible visuals and animation combined with a hilarious script, dazzling creativity, and good characters make it one of the best and most original animated films in a long time. Batman Mask of the Phantasm Batman is wrongly implicated in a series of murders of mob bosses actually done by a new vigilante assassin. Superhero fans had tons of great cartoons to watch while we were growing up, and Batman, the animated series, was right up there among the best. It combined action with a cool art style and serious plots that made the show just as appealing to adults as it was to kids. Mask of the Phantasm is a side story of that amazing show, so it's no surprise that I still love it all these years later. Ever since Phantasm came to the theaters, I was hoping that Warner Bros. would put another animated movie of that caliber on the big screen again. Phantasm is the essence of the true Batman. No bogus sidekicks, the Gotham PD hunting down Batman as if he were a threat, and a great interaction with Alfred. It works from start to end. It has a great story that flashes back to just before Bruce took up the mantle of the Bat and the woman he was involved with at the time, then skips forward to an unknown assassin killing Gotham City's mobsters, and we see how the two stories meet. The writing is top-notch, in no way predictable, and the voice acting by Kevin Conroy as Batman and Mark Hamill as the Joker is truly amazing and bone-chillingly scary. The main plot is extraordinary, offering an all-twist in the caped crusader's legend, while the romantic track, though slightly lethargic, has moments of emotion. And the action sequences are sharp. In fact, the animation is just top class. The Phantasm is the most interesting cartoon villain in a long time. And with the Joker in this movie as well, it makes for an exciting movie. This is just one of the greatest animated movies of all time. No exaggeration. For any die-hard Batman fan, this is truly a must. Iron Giant. The film's plot is similar to E.T. A young boy meets an alien robot from outer space who is stranded on Earth and runs afoul of paranoid government agents. Not to knock the Spielberg film, but what makes The Iron Giant the better film is that the young boy is the teacher. It is he who has to teach the giant about the beauty of life, the difference between good and evil, and the choices we have to make. The Iron Giant, it turns out, is a weapon who has to struggle against his own nature. The film has an obvious and timely gun control message, but its real message is about the choices we make when dealing with other people. We can use our powers for good or lash out at everyone around us. The Iron Giant was a beautiful, funny, and touching movie that is one of the best non-Disney animated movies I have seen, along with The Prince of Egypt. There wasn't a single thing I hated about the movie. For me, it was outstanding on every level. The animation was absolutely gorgeous, with stunning colourful backgrounds and brilliant character animation, especially on the Iron Giant himself. The music by Michael Kamen was consistently excellent and never overpowered the story. In fact, at times, it even enhanced the drama. And the film has a beautiful message, not to mention a sweet story. The characters were delightful. Hogarth isn't annoying at all, and the Iron Giant isn't scary in the slightest. Strictly speaking, he has to be one of the most gentle and poignant characters in an animated film. There are plenty of effective scenes like the explosive climax, and the scene with the dead deer is a real tearjerker. Enough analysis. I loved this movie. It is an animated picture like no other. It was a very, very distinct and unusual pleasure to be treated to a film such as this. Give us more, please!